Hi everybody, I'm Butch Stearns of the Pulse Network. And I'm Scott Lewer of Digital Clarity Group. And welcome to this latest edition of CMS Connected, the web content management industry's only news commentary show. How you doing, Scott? I am good, Butch. How are you? Yeah, I'm excellent too, and I'm excited about today's subject because we're going to talk about dumb data yeah. versus smart data. And we're going to discuss how to turn dumb data into smart data. So let me ask you this question just sort of to tease yes, sir. our show. All right. Dumb data versus smart data, what's the most relevant thing for this audience of CMS Connected when we're talking about this subject? Yeah, I think the key is, is that folks who are users of CMS, whether you be a marketer um, trying to work, speak to a sea of prospects, or even you're um, working with employees internally, the point is, is that everybody is trying to make more data-informed decisions, right? We're trying to use data to, to drive our decisions. And I think a real key here that we're going to start to talk about on this show is how do you make informed decisions? How do you start to make that changeover from being kind of purely uh, art form to being a little bit more scientific about it, what are the pitfalls along the way, and how do you do that kind of most appropriately so that you're making, s so that those decisions, while data driven, are good ones. You can still make bad decisions that are data driven. Yeah, and when we dive into this topic deeper, we will be joined by an expert yeah. uh, and some news to break with our expert contributor to this show, Ray Wong of Constellation Research, who has partnered up with uh, Scott Lieber. We'll get to that in a little bit, but of course, we will talk exactly about what Scott said, that what is smart data versus dumb data, and part of it is a definition of it, getting it in the right hands of the right people at the right time, relevant, useful, actionable, intuitive, digestible, all the things that make information important and valuable to a company at the right time. So that is the subject of our show. Ray Wong will be joining us from Constellation Research. Also, in our Spotlight segment, we'll be taking a closer look at Hippo CMS, and Sonny Lenarduzzi from Falcon Software will be joining us once again uh, as we do that. But first of all, let's thank our lead sponsors on this show. They are Falcon Software. The people at Falcon Software can provide you with expert advice and integration solutions for all your creative web design, your web content management, and e-commerce, social, or mobile needs. And Digital Clarity Group, DCG, is a research and advisory firm focused on navigating organizations through the digital transformation process. So, we thank our lead sponsors on CMS Connected. Time now for our headlines and our news segment here on this edition of CMS Connected. And Scott Lewer, we start with the news that Digital Clarity Group, exciting news, yeah. has partnered with Constellation Research and formed an alliance. That's right. Oh, 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 tell us about this. I mean, you touted on your, both your websites. What do we need to know? How did this come about? We did. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think we're two firms that are on similar trajectories. Uh, Ray Wong and his team over at Constellation, extremely well respected, both as a you know as an as individual analysts as well as as a as a group, um, as they you know they like to talk about Constellation as this network of stars, right? So they really do have a lot of star analysts there, and I think they've come out of the gate, most of them from the kind of legacy firms uh, in terms of as a background for them, and, and very similar to us, um, you know, they've come out essentially to really bring a new a, a new way of working, a new model into the analyst space, and do really good research for both the buy side and, and the sell side. And so we're on similar trajectories. In fact, we're kind of following in their in their footsteps a couple of years behind them. Both of the both of us uh, got uh, some accolades this year. Yeah. The IIAR um, gave them the independent analyst firm of the year. And, they and you were the new analyst firm of the year. And we were the new analyst firm of Great. the year. Yeah. So they're kind of, I guess, big brotherish like that. But I think we have complementary capabilities because awesome. we both cover this notion of digital disruption, but us from the more the experience side and them, they've got an awful lot of the, you know, they cover big data. We're going to talk to Ray later about that. Um, security, ERP, that sort of stuff. Some more backups. Well, speaking of Ray, yeah. uh, to officially tout this alliance, this partnership, let's bring in yeah. Ray Wong right now, who's Skyping in from Parts Unknown. All over the world, that's where you find Ray. His, the world is his home because he is everywhere. Ray, welcome to the show, glad to have you here. Hey, thanks, Butch. I'm not on seat 32B in the air. I'm actually on the ground, so hey, nice to see you guys. So Ray, tell us about this partnership. Again, same question to Scott. How did it come about? Why are you excited about it? 
You know, I'm really excited. This we've been following Digital Clarity Group for some time. They're covering areas really deep uh, in, especially when thinking about the creative to commerce lifecycle. That's like a very exciting part when you think about it. It's everything it takes to get someone to get to a sale. So from the design, the creative, the transformation, the marketing, the digital aspects. And what we're doing is we're spending a lot of time with various groups of CXOs on the buy side who are trying to figure out how do we put this all together. And we've got different parts that we're strong at, and we've got different. Parts that Digital Clarity Group's strong at, and you know, we thought it would be a great match. And so, I think for our clients and for prospective buyers, it's you know, one-stop shopping, a place to actually talk to experts, a place to talk to people who've done this, who've had experience. It's not like going to a place where like you've got kids that are just learning the business or trying to figure out what's going on. I mean, everybody on both our teams have like anywhere from 10 to 30 years of experience doing this stuff. So that's what gets me really excited, and I know our clients are very excited about this. Yeah, and, and we're off butch to a great start. I mean, we've got a, a Skype chat with all 30-odd people of ours between our two groups going back and forth. We're just starting our NBA, NCAA brackets right now, so <laughs> we're getting that off the mark, and there's already some bragging going on, a little bit of that. But um, no, I think, you know, and what we bring together is the ways that we've started talking about coming out of the gate with this is there's some really obvious points of research that we can do together, even like Ray was talking about in the commerce perspective. Think about what commerce does. There's the experience side of that that we we tend to kind of be on, and then there's the whole, you know, digital supply chain side of that that they can cover. So we can take on a, a you know, a topic like that, or or privacy, or things from both of our perspectives that'll be meaningful information and analyst uh, insight um, to both of our audiences. So we're going to do some joint research, and then also some events together, and that's where we're starting. All right, Ray. So hang tight. We'll be back with you with the show a little bit later on to dive into our main topic of the show: dumb data versus smart data. For news item number two in our headline segment, Scott, we look at Hippo and EMC coming together. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of, I think I know where you're going to go with this, the promise or the hope of what this could mean, but you're sort of a little skeptical because we've seen this before, right? Do, 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 you, do you think that I'm a skeptical person? Or uh, I no, skeptical? well, by nature, yes. You're esteemed and other things, but you are skeptical. But the story is that... Um, Enterprise content management and web content management capabilities under one roof yeah. with this partnership of coming together. Mm -hmm. But I guess when we look deeper into it, you know, the benefits of that are companies could optimize their information assets and provide enhanced customer experiences at the same time. But again, we've heard this before, haven't we? We have. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's my kind of biggest one. The skepticism from my part is not the possibility or the potential of these two coming together. I think it certainly makes sense. EMC was smart enough as a... <clears throat> as a enterprise content management company to basically decide to get out of the, the web content management business back in 2010 when they deprecated Documentum's web publisher product. Um, so, at, but at that time was when they formed, at the same time they made that announcement, they formed a, an alliance very similar to this where they were able to resell each other's products with Fatwire, which is now a part of the Oracle uh, suite. So they made that back in February, I think, of 2010. They made that alliance. It was really big news. It had the same promises of this, and oh, by the way, it would have had the most amount of market momentum because it was at the same exact time that they deprecated that product and told their clients, here's where you should go. Um, but really, it led to very little. I mean, there was nothing really that happened. The needle did not move for Fatwire at, at all. Then the next year, uh, in March of the next year, in fact, before Fatwire was even acquired, frankly, I think they were acquired in the summer of that year, but in, fa in March of 2011, they formed a, an alliance uh, very similarly with SDL. Um, and SDL also saw, and both of them were kind of, that was when SDL was at the top of their game, um, two big companies coming to together, and again, not so much in the market. We didn't really see much happen there. So, you know, maybe third time's a charm, and I'm sure there have been a number of other smaller times in between, but, you know, my sense is, while, yes, Hippo's view on this is going to be that there are 700 other salespeople out there that could put our, push our product, what's in it for those salespeople? Unless there's real incentive for those sales guys to go learn a completely new product with, oh, by the way, a brand that doesn't necessarily resonate with their audience, I'm not so sure that that's going to really end up leading to much. So I want to ask you for one more point about what this means for uh, EMC. Sonny Lenarduzzi in our Spotlight segment is going to be reviewing Hippo and yeah. talk more about... Um, this partnership from a HIPAA perspective, but sure. from the EMC perspective, again, you, you already said you were skeptical about the partnerships with Fatwire and SDL, yeah. but what's the promise from an EMC perspective or the strategy with partnering with HIPPO? Look, they're one? seeing, EMC is seeing that they've been kind of 
deprecated to IT. They don't anymore have a footprint into marketing. They're not able to help control experiences. They realize that digital experiences are everything, whether it's pushing data through you know, their pivotal product, which is their big, big data suite, I and mean, that's part of the theme of our show today, whether it's a way of pushing that data um, out through to various experiences, whether those are experiences on the web or whether those are experiences on you know, Internet of Things and, and into products. Um, th they want to be able to kind of take some of the capabilities they've got pushing documents um, into digital experiences and how can they make use of that pulling documents from Documentum. There's a lot of promise here. I don't deny that this would be very worthwhile for both of them um, because I think EMC feels a little bit left behind since they got rid of that capability. The other you know, there are other um, kind of uh, uh, competitors like the Oracles and the others that are out there have gone on and since acquired their own capability uh, in, the, in this sense, and they have not. So I think it's smart for them. I just think, it, you know, it comes down to the tactics. How are they incentivizing their salespeople? How does this really look um, and to, to determine whether it'll make any, any motion or not? News item number three on headlines on this edition of CMS Connected is the news that Switzerland's based Jaya is injecting new financing and new talent. So Scott, um, Piyush Patel, yes. a veteran web CMS and digital experience industry player, just been hired by yeah. Jaya as the new executive VP and general manager for the Americas for the Switzerland-based company. Also, coming right on the heels around the same time as Jaya announces the completion of a new round of funding of 22 and a half million dollars. Yeah. What's significant about these two together? Yeah, I think both are significant, and I think both are very related, by the way. Um, you know, I, um, I, I know Piyush uh, very well, and um, I know Jaya moderately well as well. I think, you know, Jaya was on a track for a long time. We just talked about Hippo, very similar kind of, you know, open source product, not necessarily based on community, but building their own product. It's kind of a portal play uh, in the market. Has always had great potential and always been, I think, a really good sound product, but really never got much marketing and didn't get out there very well because they were you know going at it on their own they didn't have an infused amount of uh, amount of capital I think the idea, though, of bringing on Piyush, Piyush, by the way, his background was he was for a long time, I think he was with Epicentric, and he was then with um, Vignette, um, and then he ended up, he was with Sapient for a number of years and actually led their global content management practice. Um, so he was the one that, you know, created uh, um, Sapient's Engage Now platform, which was essentially built on Adobe products and, and was responsible for getting that deployed to, to Sapient's audience and essentially their kind of white-labeled productized version of the Adobe stack. So he knows very much what it takes to go and create these relationships and alliances with the agency community with their very much need that Jaya needs to be able to kind of get out into the market more quickly. Um, he was also, Piyush was between Sapient and, and this role, he was also at OpenText um, where he was the alliances manager. So he's made a lot of inroads and he has good respect in that uh, in that community. Um, so, you know, I think which, what, what Piyush coming on board there, I think gives them a kind of a real credible person in the market who has not only built products and, and satisfied clients on the Jaya product, but he also has the relationships um, with the partnership community that they're going to very much need to reach out to. And I think he was critical, frankly, in getting some of this um, money uh, from Invis, actually. You are watching CMS Connected. This is our headline segment, and this is news item number four in this edition of the show. And for our headline of news item number four, it's this. The Internet of Things is useless unless you fix your big data problems. And for the details under that headline, we go to some research, Scott, mm -hmm. and research that, among other mm -hmm. things, shines the spotlight on a problem when it comes to the Internet of Things. The yeah. research is from Parstream, and Parstream, among other things, is a provider of Internet of Things analytics, right? Yes. Yeah. So they put out this research where they surveyed 203 technology and business professionals. The participants were asked a series of questions about their involvement in Internet of Things projects as well as the goals and challenges of those projects. And one of the things that come out of this is a problem. Uh, almost all organizations, 96% of them in this research, still face challenges with their Internet of Things projects. Surprising? You know, I think not. And, and specifically, I, I almost think that this is a, um, this should be labeled duh. 
<laughs> you know, like because um, you know, like this is fairly obvious. Number one, Internet of Things is really new, and people are just learning how to even figure it out. Like, what percent of organizations out there are really even doing much with Internet of Things these days? I mean, they've all there's been some RFID projects, if you want to call that Internet of Things. There's been some other things underway for a while, especially in supply chain management and those sorts of areas. But really folks are just starting to even be able to think about and ideate on the ways that they can use the Internet of Things um, here. So it's, it doesn't make, um, it's not at all a far um, stretch to say that they then therefore aren't exactly sure what to do with that data that they've captured from it. And I think this ultimately is, back to the theme of our show again, a big data problem, isn't it? Is that what, I think that's, that's what they said in the study. Yes, yeah, and that really is it. And so my follow-up to you is just that. These are 203. Yeah. Uh, business and technology professionals that yeah. were asked about this. And nearly unanimously, they said, we got a problem. We don't, we don't know what to do with, with all this. our internet of yeah. things and the data around yeah. the projects. I think the thing is, is that, look, unless you're in, you know, if you are in supply chain management, you're using Internet of Things to go figure out where packages are, when they've checked into various places, those sorts of things, you can really see a real need that's going to create efficiencies there, and you're, you've been thirsting for that data, and so therefore you're going to put it to use pretty quickly. In other cases, like, you know, um, I don't know, a wine store goes and creates the ability that when you lift up a bottle that it um, essentially tells you in the store what people are looking like, you know, and so therefore you're going to stock the shelves differently and all that. Like, people aren't, they're not using that data today. It doesn't fall into their natural form of things, and so it's not going to necessarily affect their ability to do their jobs well or not, per se, to perform. So figuring out, again, sometimes we take on projects because we can, and we go and create a need where there isn't necessarily one. And not that there's not a need. I think first we need to go think about the problems that we should solve that are really going to give us good insight and data, allow us to make better decisions in some particular way, take that small step, make an improvement, and then go. And I think that's kind of, you know, folks just want to use it because it's cool. Well, uh, that final story in our headline segment highlights the problem of the sheer amount of data that's out there for enterprises and how they're overwhelmed with it. So how do they make sense of it? How do they make meaning of it? How do they discern between what is dumb data and what is smart data? That is the subject of the show. We bring in an industry expert besides my co-host here. Uh, coming up in the meat of the show right after this, let's take a quick break on this edition of CMS Connected and we'll be back with more. Your job is to cut through the noise. To succeed, you need to reach out to your target audiences in real time with messages that speak to them. You can't let technology get in the way of your brand. That's the spirit. First Spirit is a powerful solution that helps you effectively communicate and engage with your target audience. Get an awesome ROI. Success in the market means your message got through to the right people, at the right time, in the right way. And that's why you need First Spirit. Get started with digital marketing. Visit www.espirit.com now. So you've got a great website. Your marketing team spends hours driving visitors to it and nurturing them into leads. And your sales team spends hours collecting, qualifying, organizing, and chasing those leads. Sales wants to focus on what they do best selling and marketing wants to get on with what they do best creating innovative campaigns but how do you make both teams happy the solution is marketing automation dumb data is out smart data is in that is the topic of this edition of cms connected welcome back to the show everybody i'm butch stearns of the pulse network scott lewer of digital clarity group and co-host esteemed co-host of cms connected esteemed. Uh, yeah, I can pick any like adjectives clams. I want. Like clams. Uh, dumb data is out, smart data is in. I yeah. could sit here and talk about all the statistics that I think everybody knows. We are just producing as a society more data than ever. Absolutely. So the big data problem and the big data solution are tied together, aren't they? There's so much data that you need to know which data is right and which data is smart and which is dumb. So start out for us, Scott, 
and explain the difference between smart data and dumb data. Yeah, and, and I don't think anybody sets out to, to collect dumb data, right? I think but the idea is, the idea of smart data really is creating the insights out of the data. How do you make that, you know, the, the nuggets, the gems, the things that you're gonna really understand and that help improve your business in whatever form, how do you make that available at the right time to the right person in the right context to be able to actually make better decisions based on it? Because ultimately what we're trying to do is make better decisions. Okay. Whether we're personalizing websites, you know, based on who, who's on it in, in our audience or whether we are, you know, there's all sorts of uses of, of, of big data out there. We're trying to make better social connections. We're trying to, you know, Know, improve speed of you know airlines and and you know like we'll talk to Ray from the airport so everybody's using big data the question is how do you put it to the its best use and, and make decisions so the use and the analysis of the data is more vital than ever but before we bring Ray in I would imagine that sort of a baseline a foundation has to be what makes data smart I guess I'm asking this not telling sure, you but sure. isn't it getting it in the right hands of the right people at the right time like rel the relevancy of it yeah absolutely and, and, and that, that was what I mentioned too so right hands right people right time right context right situation Got it. so it is making it available whether it's through you know within applications so that you can have the information there or whether it's just getting it into the right hands but ultimately you got to produce insights so analytics comes into this and and but it's about decision making ultimately that's what it's there for and so you've got to be able to allow that decision making to happen at the right time. Uh, let's bring in our expert now Ray Wong of Constellation Research. Ray, Ray thanks for being back on the show we appreciate your uh, contributions. Hey Butch, hey Scott, nice to see you guys. Hey good to see you Ray. Uh, so Ray, same question to you that I asked Scott, what is the difference between dumb data and smart data or expand on what Scott talked about? You know, I agree with Scott. I mean, the goal here is to take the data you have, whatever the source it is, a cell phone tower, you know, your commerce data, your POS, you know, the content that you're creating, bring it out to the information. You want to tie it back to a front end process like customer service or customer experience and then take that and then ultimately look for insights. I want to ask questions of my data. I want to know why blue sweaters sell better in Ann Arbor than green, right? You know, why do green sweaters sell better in, you know, Green Bay. I mean, these are the kind of things that you want to get to. And then ultimately, what do we do about it? Right. And that's the decisions. And there's this data to decisions pipeline that's out there. And that's how you get successful is you start to figure out where context fits so you can figure out patterns. Now, when we talk about context, that's a lot of stuff. We're talking about the roles you have. We're talking about the relationships you might have. We're talking about location, time, process place. Um, we're even thinking about how you're feeling. Are you happy? Or are you sad? And then ultimately, can we protect intention, right? A lot of people talk about prescriptive, predictive, analytic. We're ultimately getting to intention-driven systems where they can kind of guess where you're going to be, uh, kind of like that old Wayne Gretzky quote, like you want to skate where the puck is. Well, I want to guess where the customer is going to be next and at least get close. And, and that's kind of where we're headed right now with smart data. And is that the relevance, Ray, for um is that the relevance for this audience? So, so here, you know, this is CMS connected. We've got an audience of folks who are very interested in content management. Help to, you know, for them, why should they care about big data? What is it about their world where big data is going to make it somehow better, or smart data is going to make it better for them? How does it improve the content management process? It is, and it's a great point. I mean, we talk about this all the time, like 90% of the world's data and content and information was created in the last two years. We actually think 90% of that content is going to be created next year. Um, but the point being is there's so much content, and what we're trying to get is better signal-to-noise ratio. If you want to improve your content to drive attribution, drive conversion rate optimization, and to drive a sale, you've got to make your content more relevant. And that starts with context. That starts by making the data smarter. That starts by making it much more relevant so people get to it right and it's the same thing I mean basically why are you creating that content well I want to get to the right metrics and I want to get to the right outcomes Ray and Scott you too but Ray let's start with you on this you mentioned the data decision pipeline can you expand on that a little bit more it is, yeah, you know, the data decision pipeline, we got data coming at us all the place, whether it's content, whether it's a tweet stream, whether it's a POS system, uh, whether it's, you know, a creative that just got put into the system or a PLA display ad, any of that stuff, it's all over the place, right? So we want to take that and figure out what business processes these tie back to, whether it's a marketing campaign, whether it's a customer experience pipeline, whether it's a service or support call, any one of those things, that becomes an information stream. So it's upstream, downstream processes that we're going after. And then once you get to that layer, we got all these interesting patterns, right? And so what we're mining for are insights. And each of those insights, basically, it's what kind of questions are we going to ask of our data? 
And what kind of questions and answers do you hope to get? And as we get that, we surface up those patterns. Those insights then allow us to take decisions. Do we stock differently? Do we run an ad more uh, than another ad? Do we do A-B testing a different way? Um, do we look at pricing in a different way because we see a lot of demand? Um, do we change what we provide based on the context of a customer and their role or what they've purchased before? All those things come together to help us make the next set of decisions. That's a data decisions pipeline. And it's basically helping us be more contextually relevant. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so um, my comment on that is just to take it to specifically, for example, a content manager or a marketer mm -hmm. in this space, right? They've got decisions to make about, well, what should we write about even next? So they can, you know, they can use data to understand even topics that they go start to create or content that they're about to go create before they do so. It helps them make that decision. Then they go and they do so. Well, where should where should we make that available? In what context? To what personas? Under what conditions? Right? And then they're then they're seeing that, and now they're trying to drive commerce through that and outcomes. And so what you know what are what are other patterns about kind of buyers and this that they've made decisions on that we might be able to benefit from because the whole Amazon people like you. You have also, you know, also did this sort of a thing. And then it just drives that whole loop comes right back into then the next set of content that you need because here's where you're not able to convert. So those are that's that. I think that's a really great way of putting it, the data decisions pipeline. So let's go right back, uh, both of you guys, to the subject of the show, and that's dumb data uh, versus smart data. Ray, again, let me start with you again. So obviously, um, smart data, having the right data in the right hands of the right people at the right time, is going to lead you to have a pipeline that's efficient and effective and one to go back to that's fundamentally sound, I would imagine, for lack of a better explanation. So again, talk about how you get to smart data. If I'm out there, to Scott's point, and I'm in the CMS world, how do I know what the smart data is? <laughs> No, it's a great point. We're trying to figure out, like, for example, what content is about, is relevant. Right now, the hottest thing is I just came back from South by Southwest, and for the next five weeks, we're going to be hearing about Meerkat, right? Meerkat is a service where you pop up, you look, you do the video, um, and you come back out. It's live video on Twitter, right? When, and the question you might want to ask on the content side is, when is that trend over, right? How do I know when people are tired of Meerkat? How do you know when this trend is not going anymore? Uh, what do I need to do? And so we're starting to track posts. You're trying to track engagement levels. You're trying to track, you know, who's referring. Um, you're trying to figure out attribution to other sources. All that becomes important. So as you start tracking those variables, you want to know, hey, is that bigger than another story? Is that bigger than another set of content? Are we getting better response um, for Meerkat? Is that trending higher? That brings out smart data. Dumb data would be like, oh, I got like five, Five million page views and that's it. I don't know what that means, right? Or I got 10 page views or I got 20 likes, right? Dumb data is when we take data and we don't apply context to it or give it some level of relevancy. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the, by the way, I think that a really good use for Meerkat is for the exhibitionist. Are you, are you the people who just want to be like seen, they, well, never mind, let's not go there. Anyway, so I think, listen, um, to, to me, there was an old mantra with data collection before and with the idea was that kind of garbage in, garbage out, Ray, where, where people talked about that for a very long time about collecting data. And I think now, because you know our the, the the style of you know databases that are housing these and the power of the analytics tools, I think that that, that it's shifted, right? It's no longer about try to figure out exactly the questions you're trying to ask at the at the front and then collect information that, that leads you to those decisions. Rather now, there seems to be this, well, just collect it all and you can even figure out the questions later. Is that the mantra and is that a smart thing, especially considering some of the security concerns and stuff that we start to see ourselves exposed to at this point? What are your thoughts now, there? Scott, that is a great point. We're starting to see two styles emerge. You know, one is collect everything, capture everything, because it's in the cloud, because storage costs are dropping, processing speeds are dropping, and you know, we've got technologies like Hadoop. Um, you know, DMP platforms are getting easier to use. All those things are actually starting to make that kind of transfer. Um, but there's another group that says, hey, collect the data that you just need, um, because you can't possibly process all that data as quickly. I think there's an answer somewhere between the middle. But right now we see people religiously going after both sides of the house. Um, I'm kind of on the camp, collect as much as you can because one day we're going to find some patterns that are going to be relevant. But you know, there, there are companies like you know GE that's got jet engines that they're 
you know, pushing off like what a terabyte a second of data. I don't know if I really want to keep all that data. You might want to take an exceptions based approach there to figure out what's going on. But but it's important to capture all that data because we're starting to apply statistical algorithms and patterns. There's something called a topological data analysis. And basically what it is is a bunch of math that allows you to figure out patterns. Are certain networks closer than others? And people are using these kind of techniques across big data sets to figure out Hey, is that a cancer cell over there? Or wait, is that the best referral that you have? Wait, is that a better A-B test? Does that content actually deliver better ROI than someone else's content? We're starting to see things like that where math is being applied to these big data sets, crunching these things that are happening in seconds, not in days. And so you know, this is why both actually have a shot. It's just a question of how much data can you sift through, how good your math, and you know, maybe you have some data scientists running around that can actually process this. You are watching CMS Connected on this edition of the show. Scott Lewer and Butch Stearns, the web content management industry's only news commentary show. We are focusing on dumb data versus smart data. The title of the show, the theme, smart data is in, dumb data is out. Um, let me get to this point, Scott. We started this show talking about Ray Wong and Constellation Research and Digital Clarity Group, your company, forming a partnership, an alliance as analysts. I would imagine that this statistic that was put up by McKinsey and Company sort of leads to the power of that alliance and some of the reasons why. According to McKinsey and Company, there's a shortfall of almost 200,000 experts and over 1 million data experts with the skills that businesses need mm -hmm. to make it out there, to make sense of all of this. Mm -hmm. So there's obviously the need for analysts that know what they're talking about. Exactly. You guys have partnered up and said, okay, well, there might be a shortfall, plenty of work for all of us, but yeah. we're gonna stand out in the disruptive end and be straight. What does that say to you that there's a shortfall? Is that a scary picture for this industry? You know, I think, um, and, and Ray just teed Jeff for that perfectly with his last comment was about data analysts and stuff. I think there is a real need. We're seeing certainly from, from the side of the world that we're working on in the marketing side, there's this constant call for marketers to become better data analysts, right? And there's uh, a constant call for, I think we, you're seeing that as, um, I've talked to a number of folks that are saying they're counseling their kids to go into becoming you know, data analysts. There's an awful lot of roles out there for that because of this really quick, uh, you know, before the market really could really bear it, all of a sudden we've just got these treasure troves of data that's growing like crazy. Um, I think there is a real need um, for data analysts, but I also think that there's a, a smarter way of going about it that there's a need as well for technology to be able to help you with some of those decisions that the idea about putting context uh, you know, the, the the insights in the right place at the right time, all that sort of stuff, to me means that there's a way that I can fuse, that I can fuse some of this information and data into existing applications where people are working today to make whatever it is that they're doing that much better or more effective. And that may not require necessarily a, a data analyst be sitting within every group per se, but right. data analysts who are you know, helping build these systems, for example, or within the, whether they sit in the IT group or some hybrid, wherever. So I think you can still have this few to many relationship of data analysts. For, you don't have to be sitting side by side with one. We're not gonna be taken over by, by data analysts, but certainly there is a voice in a vacuum of them there. Um, and maybe, maybe Ray, you have some thoughts about that. I think you're, you're working with an awful lot of buy-side companies um, who are trying to kind of figure out their big data strategies. Is data analysts something that they're really in desperate need of? And how do you see that kind of landscape today? Yeah, they are. I think there's still a shortage of data scientists, data analysts that are out there. That's a very important component of this. Um, but the other half that's important as we're getting engineers and mathematicians and scientists and technologists out there, we also need to have the other side of the equation, which are digital artisans, right, who can balance that with anthropology or philosophy or design thinking um, or experience management because what's actually happening is we're trying to blend both the right brain and the left brain as we look at this data. We're thinking about patterns. We're putting systems thinking in place. And this requires a different kind of approach that's not necessarily just a science or data scientist approach. So both are actually becoming very important. Clients, customers, brands, organizations, they're all looking for the ability to balance that out to figure out what some of these patterns are that are out there. And of course, you know, use that and get to the scale that you were talking about, Scott, where we can automate these things and be there to be successful. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think it's a really good point that you make there to balance that left and right brain, Ray. And, I, you know, a point of caution I'm constantly, you know, making to folks is that, you know, some of this, especially, you know, you're thinking of marketing and whatever, there's an awful lot of art in that, you know, and, and we're trying to introduce science to that. And while that's certainly relevant, I think the nice thing about art 
is that you try something, you, you want to see if it works, and you're trying to figure that out, right? You're trying to, you, you don't necessarily know if this is going to work, and so you're trying to figure it out. The challenge with data is that when people think that their decisions are backed by data and are informed by data, they're much more adamant that this is the way to go for example. Mm. And it might have just as much question in it, quite frankly, but I think our mistakes can be far greater, frankly, if they are data driven because you can interpret data incorrectly. Data doesn't lie, but data doesn't necessarily tell you the whole story either. And so I think you can make a lot of bad decisions based on data, but the fact is you'll make them fairly, I think, more demonstrably and more fiercely if you think that the numbers are supporting your, your claims. And so I think that's dangerous. So Scott and Ray, let's talk a little bit more about um, deploying a data management strategy, if you will. Uh, Gartner had a survey last year, uh, and when we go to it and we look at uh, some of the numbers, we can see from 2013 to 2014 that the um, when it comes to big data adoption, that brands that are already deploying a data management strategy increased exponentially from 13 to 14. Do you, do we expect that number to go up even higher now? I would imagine you would. I, I would definitely think so. Uh, data management strategy is really important as, go, as you're going forward. It's not just that fact that there's all this data out there. We actually believe by 2020, 60% of all the data is gonna be sitting, 60% of all the data that you are gonna use is gonna be sitting outside of your four walls, which means you're gonna be accessing data as opposed to actually collecting it. And so your ability to quickly access, bring different data sources together to then use that to make decisions is important. Scott made a really good point. You can make a lot of dumb data decisions with your uh, with a scientific approach. And it's also making sure that you have the right level of data, that the source of the data is there, the data preparation, the data quality is in place, the data governance, making sure that you know um, where that source is and the quality of that data. It's going to be very important, especially when we're doing a lot of access versus ownership and cleansing of that information. That, 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 that's good stuff. I, I, want, I wonder, I touched on this earlier just really briefly, Ray, but I wonder if you can provide some commentary. We've seen, you know, an, an awful lot of uh, companies here, you know, you can look at Target, you can look at Anthem, a number of them that have had these data breaches. And we talked earlier about the kind of approach that one takes. Do you collect it all and sit on it? As I think you were saying, that might be a way of advocating it, but you got to figure out some happy medium there. Are companies, especially as it relates to personal data, which certainly in the marketing world we would be talking probably about information that's fairly personal, um, are they putting themselves at greater risk and how do, they, how do you see companies today countering that? Are they even concerned with that at all? Because I think their, their brand reputations are on the line here. You look at an anthem, but, I mean, they're, they're hosed. They got, there's, there's 10, um, there are 10 attorneys general out there telling their constituents in their states don't open anything from Anthem again. Like, if that happens to your brand, you're hosed. Um, you're in the digital dark ages at this point. What's your thought on that? <laughs> oh my God, yeah, you are so hosed. Um, here's the issue, there, there are a couple angles. The first one is, with all three of those examples, those were inside jobs. So the human factor was the issue, right? Not that we get rid of humans there, but because of the human factor, that was the weakest link. The second thing is though, with your data, you've got to mask that data all the time, right? Whether especially PI information, that privacy, private information that you're using, that stuff's got to be masked. It's got to be encrypted so that, you know, at least you're not taking a chance with it in terms of getting it in the wrong hands. But then the third piece is really about giving customers the choice to opt in on the data pieces that they're willing to share. Um, and they're willing to share more when you can trade some of that privacy information, some of that for convenience. Um, and so people need to understand how that data is being used, not that it's all being taken and being sold to your affiliates for fun purposes. You know, it's got to have some kind of value and it's got to be customer driven for that to work. So those are three things we typically tell our clients, um, whether they're brands or whether they're like, you know, enterprise organizations in the B2B world. All right, so let's, um, let's finish this conversation about big data versus um, smart data with maybe some takeaways for this audience, for CMS Connected. Sure. Scott, look into your crystal ball, look ahead yeah. for the next two or three years, and um, what factors are going to play a critical role uh, in the success of big data projects, and what trends will drive growth 
and the big data industry. Again, tailored to this audience. Yeah, sure. So specifically for this audience, you know, factors that will lead to success here are, you know, again, I think number one is what are we deciding to collect, right? What information are we deciding to collect? Two, how are we using that 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 data to make decisions? So this idea of is it a data analyst that's there? Are we getting systems? Are we, you know, look, I think ultimately, for example, A/B testing in the in the marketing and content management space is the most talked about feature, but yet the most underused feature. I mean, people are really not making very data di driven decisions. So I think the first thing you need to do is not collect data for the sake of collecting data, but start to decide, okay, how and where and what are the right times and approaches that I can start trying to use data to help inform my decisions, where are the most appropriate places, and let me just kind of start one piece at a time. You're not going to, you shouldn't be, you know, there's a, there's, you shouldn't be kind of shifting the pendulum from one end to the other extreme, you know, immediately. I think it's about finding those spots, getting in your lane, showing good decisions, and, and, and then measuring the results of that, uh, and, and being able to see, you know, the, the effect that it's having is it in fact moving the ball better are you achieving your goals that sort of stuff I think is the, so what are you collecting is. and how are you using it Ray uh, I'm sure you concur with Scott's analysis there but what advice do you have when you sit as an analyst with a client or with uh, people that just you know follow you and talk about the trends that are happening in big data and how they should form their foundation for big data projects I would add to I think that Scott said um, by saying we also need a feedback loop and that feedback loop is important so we can learn from our mistakes. We can do massive A-B testing on that data um, and we can figure out, you know, what content as ex like people get excited about, what content's been successful. So I, I think when we start with the end in mind by figuring out what metrics do we want to apply, what business metrics we want to apply to that content, um, that's, that's one of the things that we typically recommend. The second thing is really also looking at different ways continuity plays a role. One of the things that we talk about in, in the book that I'm publishing with Harvard Business Review Press, Disrupting Digital Business, is that we got to create a continuity of experience. And that's a continuity of the content, continuity of the customer, continuity of a channel, continuity of a business process, and, and the role content plays in keeping that continuity and the interest inside a customer, inside a prospect, a supplier, or even you know, a, a partner. And so all those things are coming in play and, and making that much more relevant is part of that intention driven design that, that I think that's going to be a big piece of that customer experience, it's going to be a big piece of building a content management strategy. Ray, and so uh, first of all, listen, thanks very much for being on the show. I'm, I'm glad you just mentioned your book. It's, um, say the title again for everybody. It's about to come out in May, I know that. It's officially out in every airport in the world, May 5th, and where bookstores, books are sold. Disrupting Digital Business is the title. Disrupting Digital Business. I know I've already put in my pre-order uh, and my team will have it. We really appreciate you have, having you on the show. Your insights are fantastic and uh, um, our audience appreciates you uh, joining us today. Thanks, man. Hey, thanks a lot. All right, Ray, thanks for your contributions. Thanks for being a part of the show. Ray Wong of Constellation Research on this edition of CMS Connected. Boy, he should really be a little more passionate about the, <laughs> what he likes to talk about. One huh? thing he doesn't lack is passion. Time now for our spotlight segment on this edition of CMS Connected. And in the spotlight today, we are going to review Hippo CMS, a company founded in 1999, headquartered in the Netherlands, an open source Java CMS platform with strong capabilities in personalization or for personalization and targeting e-commerce and more. And joining us, as she does so often in our spotlight segment, from Falcon Software is Sonny Lenarduzzi. Sonny, how are you? I'm great, how are you? I'm excellent, so let's dive right into this. Uh, what do we need to know about Hippo? What's the history of the company? Uh, well, they've definitely got a history, that's for sure. They've been around, like you said, since 99. Um, and they had a decent start uh, in Europe and were gaining some momentum there, but um, they've been through a lot of inter iterations uh, through the history of the company. And um, one of the things that I found really fascinating about this company, I think is kind of a rarity in the space, is they've actually never received any funding. So the entire thing's been bootstrapped by uh, the company itself. So that I found uh, pretty fascinating about the history of, of Hippo. And um, in 2008, like I said, they wanted to make their mark internationally. So a 
extend beyond Europe. Um, and so they rebuilt their whole product from scratch over two years. Uh, they implemented a new management structure. They appointed a new CEO, which is an interesting move in a lot of ways. It, it meant that they were ready to scale. And, uh, and they also acquired US-based uh, Blue Sunrise Inc. So they've basically gone from a services model to an open source model to an enterprise subscription model. Um, and that's been since 2010. And that's when really we in North America have, have really taken note of Hippo. All right, Sonny, let's bring in Scott Lewer for this conversation, also our esteemed co-host here on CMS Connect. That's twice I've used the word esteemed describing you, are, yeah, you today. Exactly. Exactly. Anyway, I uh, build you up so I can knock you down. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, earlier in this show, we yeah. talked about the partnership yes. alliance of EMC and Hippo, and you had some skepticism yep. about how that was going to benefit uh, exactly. Hippo or EMC. Yeah. Talk about that and ask Sonny about that. Yeah, so I, I think, Sonny, I'd, lo I'd love to hear your take on what I was saying earlier, which is that, you know, to me, I, I think it's it's wonderful for both parties. I'm just skeptical given that EMC has had a history of these sorts of partnerships with, with Fatwire before it was bought by Oracle, with SDL, and it really didn't make much of a bump because they've got such a wide base of, of, of sales folks that they're not out there necessarily interested in pushing their, their partners along. What did they say to you about this partnership and how, how important it was to their strategy? Um, extremely important. Um, and if not from a tactical perspective um, and actually the use of the product, but from a sales perspective, I mean, if we're going to talk money uh, strictly, this gives them basically 700 extra salespeople uh, selling the product for them uh, in the States. So I think that's a huge benefit, obviously, but also the, the uh, integration with the host of tools that EMC has available. If that's something that's going to be really pushed, it's hugely beneficial to uh, Hippo's strategy. And one of the standout features for me, and I, I don't know if your take will be the same on this, um, but Pivotal is is a pivotal part of this strategy, I think. And that's one of EMC's uh, tools that they have available. And um, from a social media perspective, which is my forte, um, one of the things that they can do with Pivotal is actually analyze sentiment from Twitter and use that to customize the, customize the experience uh, for the consumer on the site. And I think that is the future. I think that's huge. And I think it's it's the right step in the right direction of using that social sentiment, real-time sentiment, and using it to create uh, extremely advanced customer experiences on the site to create more success and lead generation. Look at Sonny tying in parts of our show. Here we are on a, on a big data show, and Pivotal is EMC's big data suite, essentially. So what she's talking about there is Hippo being able to actually figure out how to tap into that kind of big data capabilities, those analytical capabilities, and then thus improve the experience. That they, she is our expert analyst in the Listen, spotlight segment. I mean, you act surprised that she went there. I, you know what? That did sound surprising yes. in the same way that it sounds surprising to you that I am esteemed, but I meant no uh, harm by that. One question. I'll ask you, Sonny, is <laughs> the question that I'll ask you is, did you yet get yourself a, a little orange hippo? Because my kids, I don't want to show favoritism, but the best thing about hippo from my perspective is they've got these little four and a half inch hippo, these little squishy hippo things, and my kids, they grew up on those. Actually, they grew up on a diet of those because they had one. I brought one home from Are a. Are they gummy hippos? I brought one home from a trade. No, you're not supposed to, but <laughs> mine did. I brought them home from a trade show, and next thing you know, it had no legs and no things. And I sent the picture, like, I think I tweeted the picture to Hippo. Next thing I know, I got this FedEx box of like 10 hippos. So my kids have grown up with these little orange hippos. <laughs> Isn't that great? If that's awesome. Yeah. I, I would like to have a few of those as well. That's uh, that's pretty amazing. So like they literally, my kids will never forget hippo. Like I mean, the orange hippo is like they know that. They All right, Sonny, let me let me reel this sorry, sorry, back sorry, in sorry. before it goes off the rails completely. Right. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you about differentiators for hippo from its competitors. Drupal is obviously a competitor. What what differentiates hippo in your opinion after looking deeper into this company? Um, I mean, model the platform itself is PHP versus um, versus Java. So um, Drupal, I would say, yeah, it's for sure the main competitor. And when people are trying to figure out who they're going to go with, this this is the main comparison to go with. But um, I think it's really based on preference. Um, you're either looking at a full suite or you're looking at best of breed, which is connecting to other players like Salesforce and Marketo and really being able to integrate those into your strategy. Um, and I think when you're talking about Hippo, you're talking more so about web content management as a focus as, a, as opposed to, like I said, an entire um, suite. And 
depends on how much weight you put um, on awards and things like that. But I mean, um, if you're looking at something like that, Hippo did take home in 2013 uh, CMS Critics uh, Critics Choice Award for Best Open Source CMS. 2014, they took home People's Choice for Best uh, Enterprise Java CMS. So it depends on how much weight you put in towards like that. But I do think that those obviously do differentiate them from the competition. Notable companies, notable organizations that are using Hippo. Uh, they've got some pretty big, impressive players that they're working with. Uh, Disney World generates one uh, over 1.4 billion a year in sales, 70 million unique visitors a year. Huge undertaking, so that's one of their customers. Another one is Randstad, which is uh, the second largest recruitment firm in the world. Um, Waleda, uh, they're combining uh, Hippo with an e-commerce software, um, so great integration for them, and it's helping them personalize the web experience. Um, Hellerman Titan is another one. Largest cable company in the world, and Condé Nast, Mailchimp, Bear—the list kind of goes on. They've, they've got some pretty impressive uh, customers in their lineup. So, what do you, you know? So, I think it really pains me to hear constantly, and I don't mean this from you. I mean that they are compared to the likes of, you know, a company like, a, you know, a, a product like Drupal, et cetera, just because they're both open source. And I even don't even love the idea of that the Critics' Choice Award, the category was open source, because there are so many different flavors in the same way of, you know, closed source or proprietary, rather. Um, so I actually think they're, you know, far more comparable even to an SDL or an Adobe or whatever, just given the product's capabilities, that it is more um, fairly enterprise oriented. They don't nearly have the breadth of capabilities because unlike Adobe, they don't have all those features and functions of things. But I think in terms of the robust ability for it to be able to support fairly complex environments and complex content needs, I think it's uh, more comparable to those. I wonder, A, Sunny, your impression on that, and B, if you could just take a minute to tell us about kind of the new things that they're liking to talk about, which is this notion of content performance. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I, I agree with you for sure. And I think uh, maybe I sound like a broken record saying <laughs> most of the people we talk about, their competitors are Adobe and Sitecore. Um, and I would say that that's the same case here for Hippo. Um, and yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Drupal is a comparison, but it, but I do think that they, their capabilities are probably a little stronger. And when it comes to um, the functionalities of the platform, it's, it's not about it just being a toolbox. So that's kind of how I see it. And I see it being um, something that is great for integrating with other uh, opportunities. And that's where I think this EMC partnership is a huge benefit to them if, you know, if I'm not taking the skeptical side, if it goes uh, according to how they say it's going to go and how, if, the, if the success of the partnership is actually going to be uh, optimal for their side and not just for EMCs. Um, but as far as the future, uh, it's pretty exciting for Hippo. Um, so there's a new version coming out in May, another iteration of what they're doing. And I, I think that's great about this company is they're kind of always staying on the pulse of how they need to be changing and developing. And Scott, I mean, this is something that you can touch on, but uh, they're really building on the content performance aspect aspect of it. So really taking those analytics and seeing how not just pushing out the, the content, but also seeing how it's how it's performing and customizing based off of that. And uh, yeah, Scott, I'd love to get your thoughts on, on what that's going to do for the company. Yeah, I think, you know, first of all, this is, um, they were really, Hippo is, has has transformed nicely, as you said. They, they were very, um, their sole purpose in life was just to be a content management system, and they wanted to do nothing else. They just wanted to kind of be that part of the, lar the larger ecosystem. Of, they've ver very much transformed to start to include other capabilities that they think that it's going to appeal to marketers. And one of them is this idea that you mentioned about content performance. And I think the idea there is that they start to get into the notion of analytics, but the thing about analytics today is typically it's a tag on a page, and so marketers are able to see how a page performed, but a page is composed of a whole lot of content. And um, because Pip Hippo has this very purist view of content management, that content is dis disparate pieces that can be reused in lots of places, um, made multilingual, et cetera, now their notion of content performance tells not only how that page performed, but frankly, more importantly, how the disparate pieces of content performed not only on a particular page they were pulled in, but in all the pages they were pulled in, across, across throughout your site or multiple sites. Um, and so I think that's really important that people can see the performance of it within the context. And that really allows you to make, I think, better decisions. And so I, I think that's a really interesting take um, on that capability. So, so Sonny, let's finish up with uh, maybe one reinforcing thought from you. Or what, let me ask you the question this way. You spent time with this company. You've done a lot of research on Hippo. We've talked all about the latest, you and Scott both. 
What's the one thing that really sticks out to you about Hippo? Um, I, I personally am, I feel like I'm always doing this in this segment, but I'm very excited about this partnership with EMC. Um, I think it's just going to catapult them into a, a different level in this space. And I think they are being recognized now as a front runner in this space and, and definitely more competitive than they used to be um, and gaining more moment, momentum and obviously working with some huge um, clients, like I mentioned. So I'm very excited to see the next iteration of the product and also to see how this partnership with EMC is going to develop um, because I think that it definitely could make them uh, top tier. All right, Sonny, thanks for your time. If you would like to reach out to Sonny, you can find her on Twitter at Sonny Lenarduzzi. She is unique, as unique as her name implies. Trust us. And you see that on this show every time. Sonny, thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sonny. Sonny Lenarduzzi with our Spotlight segment. All right, time now for our CMS Insider segment. This is where, Scott, you are the insider and you give us some invaluable, you usually charge for this. Let's just put it that way, exactly right? Exactly right. You come okay. here, you get five minutes of this, five minutes of, of free goodness. This is free to the audience free right goodness. now. Yeah, wow. Exactly. All right. Isn't enterprise social networking and intranets the same thing? Let me repeat the statement. Isn't enterprise social networking and intranets the same thing? That's the subject you're diving into right now as our insider. Are they? Right. Are they the yeah. same thing? What are we talking about here? Yeah, aren't they the same thing? I think the answer is no, they're not the same thing. Um, you know, look, enterprise social networks are looked by many that, you know, take the likes of Yammer, the idea of Facebook within the enterprise, et cetera. We're all trying to figure out where does social play in terms of helping us be more effective within our organizations. We know that we've got, you know, typically an enterprise today has got people all around the world um, that are working uh, in, in, on various projects, they're working in various ways, and so how can we kind of connect them to achieve a number of goals? Number one is, how can we get the kind of power and efficiency of them being able to learn and work from each other? And number two is, how can, um, how can we make sure that we retain as an organization as much of the information about ourselves as possible so that if somebody were to leave, they're not taking uh, IP out the door or our information out the door with them. And so I think that's what they're both trying to solve. But the answer to me is, if intranets are old, which we should talk about that next, but if intranets are old, is, is you know, are enterprise social networks the next thing? No, I think that enterprise social networks are a part of the morph and a part of the pivot into what kind of the new version 2.0 of intranets is, but they are not subsistently the next wave. So are intranets old? Are they outdated? Are they useless? If I have Yammer, should I blow it up? Yeah. Look, I, th I think, again, if we look at what's the goal of what uh, intranets were, typically it's connect people, maintain information, allow them to be more efficient because they can maybe have one place to go to get access to what so-and-so is working on or that one, so to get access to you know, enterprise information. So um, if that was the goal, the challenge with that, where they typically have fallen down, and internet is just a label, so it means many things to many different companies, but where they've been viewed as kind of deemed failures is often because they are not a part of the way that people do work, the way that employees do work. And so the desire was, well, if I can go and figure out, Butch, what kind of projects that you're working on, and I might be over here and you're over there, well, then I can go learn from you. Well, the problem is that you're not putting your information out on the intranet about it mm. because there's no step in your process of completing that project mm. that makes it so. It's not a part of you doing that work, right? And so therefore, it's actually an added piece of work, which frankly has no benefit to you That's in that project point. whatsoever. So you've got to now go write up what you're doing, all that sort of stuff, and, and then so that I can come and learn from you later. And frankly, all that I'm going to then go do is bother you with questions um, about it, right? And so because it wasn't a part of the way we do or that's where many of them have failed. And the most popular thing on any internet today is the cafeteria menu, right? As well as the people finder <laughs> so that I can go find you know, the, the phone number for somebody. So those are the two most popular things on any internet. I think though, um, so, so the answer is, do you need to blow it up? No, but I think you do need to figure out how to get an intranet, whatever form it takes, to be a more a part of the way that people do work. Yeah, I mean, the picture you just painted, my question to you is gonna be this. So then what is enterprise social networking? 
Okay. Like, what, how, what is your definition of it? Because I think we hear all these terms, yeah. and if I'm an organization, I hear it, but so what is that? I'm starting to hear that, and it may be more effective. But let me go back to your point and make a quick comment. The goal of it is collaboration. Correct. I've worked as an organization. I've spent time and resources just to get some people, most people, to collaborate using this platform, let's say, That's right? right. Yep. And right now, I'm having some degree of success. I'm a global company, let's say. So I've just got them on there, and they're getting used to doing it. Correct. You painted the negative, yep. that they're not collaborating with the way they do because they don't use it as their primary source. They're not having it out there on the internet. Mm -hmm. So it's not doing So again, what is ESN? What, is so, it an acronym? Yeah, Should I, it I don't be? think we really use that. And let's not go create another acronym because there's so <laughs> many of them out there. And I get blamed for creating new acronyms all the time. That's not one that I care enough okay. about to put my, my personal brand on it. But you can have it on yours. Don't want yeah. it. Look, I think um, the, what enterprise social networks do is that we certainly know uh, that people have a desire to be social. They have a desire to collaborate with each other. They have a desire to get information out of each other, and so that's valuable. The, the thing is, is that it can't be a side thing either. So in the same way that intranets were not a part of the way that you're working, um, you know, ES... <laughs> Enterprise social networks are viewed sometimes as like, it's just the virtual water cooler now. And so is it just my way of going and interacting with people? Is it my way of sharing pictures? Is it my way of just having side chats and whatever that are not necessarily helping me get work done, but actually distracting me from doing work? So if we can combine these two things now, right. where we have this idea of how do I integrate the, what, the way that people work with collaboration networks that allows them to communicate in that way, that they can be more communicative to their, but it's actually a part of the way that they're doing work, part of the way that they're doing projects. If, for example, and, and therefore then the data and information about those products becomes a byproduct instead of the, the, the specific, it's a, by, it's a benefit that um, is reaped from it and then can be mined and tapped into as opposed to being the thing that you're necessarily seeking and you're there, therefore forcing out of people. So final point about this, important questions to ask as an organization, I guess. If I'm that global company, again, mm -hmm. I've got Yammer, or I've got something that I'm using to some varying degrees of success. Mm -hmm. I don't want to blow it up. I don't want to start. You've already told us that they're not the same thing. Yep. You've already said that you don't necessarily have to blow it up. Right. But where do I begin? What are the important questions to ask? Exactly, yeah. So the important questions to ask are, you know, what am I trying to accomplish overall by all of this? Am I trying to create efficiencies here? Am I trying to improve? Um, I don't know, maybe I'm actually using some of these tools to try to, you know, improve the mental state of my, mental health of my employees because I've got a disenfranchised group or something. But this can backfire on you very quickly. But what am I trying to achieve by this? Um, number two is, where are the pockets then that, again, kind of back to even when we were talking about big data and how to put data to use, where can I go and find a process that people have to do today that's a part of their job that I can make better by allowing them to communicate with others uh, in, a, in a digital way and that I can infuse as a part of that process that maybe the way that they need to go, everything from, you know, instead of creating a separate document about my, about the kind of project champion thing for what the goals of it are, maybe if that's a part of some application that I'm using and I'm entering that information, now that same step, I don't have to make it a second one and I can make it a part of that process. So how can I infuse the way that people work with this so that the byproduct becomes the great information, um, the insights, and the collaboration? Scott Lee, we're in our CMS Insider segment here on CMS Connected. That's going to do it for this edition of CMS Connected. We want to thank our guests, as always, yep. Sonny Lenarduzzi, Ray Wong That's from right. Constellation Research. He was awesome on uh, today's show. Mark your calendars because our next show is going to come your way April 16th. Mm -hmm. When that show airs, we will be have... We will be coming to you from the WeConnectIntra.net Reloaded show in Boston. Uh, we're going to be on site yep. with that show, and that show will air on April 16th. Before we go, I'd like to thank our lead sponsors, Falcon Software and Digital Clarity Group. So get connected. And stay connected. On CMS Connected, and we'll see you next time on April 16th.